Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you transform us by the renewing of our mind, that you would, by your Spirit, by your Word, change us. We submit to you and we ask your will to be done in our lives as we study your Word. We ask that you'd help us to be doers of your Word, applying these truths to the way that we live. We commit this time to you and we ask that your will be done and we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and give you thanks. Amen. Well, we're studying the life of Abraham. If you'll open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 12, we'll pick up where we left off. God has called Abraham, and he told him that he would bless him. And not only would he bless him, he would make Abraham a blessing. And he said that every nation in the world would be blessed by him. In our last study, Abraham made it to his destination. He was faced with the danger of famine, and he made a decision. He went down to Egypt, down into the world, and we had mentioned that he's going to run into trouble, and he does. And the sad thing about all of it is we find in Abraham's life a wasted witness. That's the title of our study today, a wasted witness. Let's pick up reading in verse 10. It was the last verse we looked at. It says, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall slay me. They shall say, This is his wife, and they shall kill me, he says. But they will save thee alive. Abram's got a concern. One worry leads to another. One fear leads to another. It grows. That's what sin does in our life. He was afraid of the famine. He goes down to Egypt. Before he gets to Egypt, he gets to thinking. That's what got him into trouble to begin with. He should have been praying. He's, he's, he's thinking about what might happen, potential problems. And We looked in our last study. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your path. So he's there, and he's thinking that because his wife, Sarai, is so beautiful to look upon, he's going to get there and the men of the land are going to take her and kill him. So he comes up with a plan. Verse 13 says, he says, I pray thee. He should have been praying to the Lord, but he's praying and asking his wife. He said, I pray thee, thou art my sister, which is true. They had the same father, but not the same mother. It says that it may be well with me for thy sake. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That it may be well for me, with me, for thy sake. This is for your best interest, honey. <laughs> he says, and my soul shall live because of thee. I need you to do me a favor. He says, and it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. So Sarah's taken into the palace there with Pharaoh. Abraham was right in that she was a good-looking woman, and they may take note of her, and they did. And it says that in verse 16, that he, Pharaoh, entreated Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. Now, take note of verse 16 because verse 16 is going to come up in a future study that we have of Abraham. But verse 17 says this, And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. 
Before Pharaoh can take Sarah and have his way with her, God in his grace and his mercy protects Sarah and keeps Pharaoh from doing her any harm. Abraham has really put both of them in a bad situation because of his own doings, his own decisions. And as the title of our study, A Wasted Witness, we're going to see that's the problem with going down into the world in the first place. Far too many Christian people are trying to live in the world instead of living where God has called them. The scripture says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. God called Abram out of Ur and out of Haran into, into Canaan, into the promised land, where God wanted him to be in his will. But he let a crisis, a danger, a famine lead him down towards Egypt. And as he was going into Egypt, he's tempted again. And we are, we're, we're always tempted, as we're entering into the world, to live a lie. Every time you see a Christian living in the world, you see a man, a woman, a teenager, living a lie. They're trying to fit in in a place that they don't belong, and they're, they're having to compromise in their own mind in order to survive in a place where they shouldn't be in the first place. He went into Egypt to survive the famine, but once he gets to Egypt, he realizes that he's got to do other things to survive in Egypt. He would have been better off trusting the Lord back in Canaan to provide for his needs. You say, well, he's not lying. Abraham and Sarah, she was his sister. That's true. It's a half-truth. <laughs> if you're comfortable living half-truths, you might fit well in with the world as a believer. But as Abraham's going to find out, living a lie in the world is a wasted witness. God doesn't call us out of the world so that we can live like the world. He's called us out of the world so He can use us as instruments to call others out of the world. But Abraham goes back into the world and starts acting like the world immediately, looking out for himself instead of his wife, coming up with schemes and plans and living half-truths, acting like he's still wanting to try to be what God wants him to be, but he wants to fit in in the world, and he doesn't want to have any consequences of being there because they're not going to like him there if he's who he is and his wife is what she is, so he tries to live a compromised life. It never works, it never has, it never will. The sooner we learn this, the better. Jesus said you're in the world, but you're not of the world, so we shouldn't be acting like the world. Be that as it may, Abraham goes down there, but I want you to look at verses 18 and 19. We're going to see three things that Pharaoh asks Abram. And I believe it's, it's three questions that the world has asked Far too many Christians, me included. I believe that there's a sinner out there somewhere who could ask each one of these three questions of me, and it's a shame that they can. Look at verse 18. After this plague strikes Pharaoh, no doubt God tells him why, because Abraham didn't tell him what was going on with him and Sarah, so most likely God reveals to him why he's plagued. And verse 18 says, And Pharaoh called Abram and said, First question. First question that the world asks a Christian with a wasted witness. What is that thou hast done unto me? What have you done unto me? Why did you do this to me? Far too many Christian people are in the world the Lord has us in the world, but we're not of the world. We, don't, we shouldn't be going down into the world. We're living there. God has us here for a reason. But we live and we act and we treat the unsaved in ways that they're asking. Because believers have far too low a standard for their own lives than do sinners have for them. It's interesting to me that sinners know how believers are supposed to act. Even more so at times than the way that believers know how they're supposed to act. And here Pharaoh is calling Abram, the father of faith, 
the man that God started all of Israel with. He's rebuking him. And he asks, what have you done to me? We need to seek God on a daily basis and rely upon the Holy Spirit so that this question is not asked of us, of the unsaved in the world. What have you done to me? We need to be loving our neighbor and treating the unsaved the way that we ought to. They shouldn't be asking, why did Gordon do that to me? He's a Christian. He's a pastor. Why did he do that to me? I didn't think pastors, I didn't think Christians were supposed to act and treat other people that way. First question. What is this that thou hast done unto me? It's my prayer that that never be asked of me again. I don't ever want to be in the world living a lie looking out for myself, and in the process, hurting the unsaved and having them ask, Why? What is this that you've done? Why would you do this to me? Notice the second question in verse 18. Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why didn't you tell me the truth? There's a lot of sinners that could ask that question of a lot of saints. Why didn't you tell me the truth? Well, we know why Abraham didn't tell the truth, and it's probably why we don't tell the truth most of the time. He was looking out for his own neck. If he told Pharaoh that Sarah was his wife, he was afraid that threat would come his way. And I think far too many times Christians do the same thing. Not because of sister-wife issues like Abraham, but bringing it down to where we live, where the rubber meets the road for application for us. We're afraid to tell the truth because we're afraid of what the world's going to do to us if we do. You know, telling the truth about abortion, telling the truth about adultery, telling the truth about marriage, telling the truth about homosexuality, telling the truth that there's only one way to heaven and His name is Jesus Christ and no other religion is right. Telling the truth. Why didn't you tell me the truth? How many people are suffering in this world because Christians failed to tell them the truth? How many people are suffering because I, didn't tell them the truth. How many people are living under the pangs of a plague because I did not tell them the truth? A wasted witness. There's one more question. It's found in verse 19. He said, Why saidest thou she is my sister? So the first question, What did you do to me? The second question, why didn't you tell me the truth? The third question, why did you lie to me? Why did you lie to me? Far too many Christians are compromising. They have opportunities to tell the truth. Theological questions, questions about salvation, questions about hell, questions about the consequences of sin. And, and we find ourselves in those situations and we water down the truth. We tell a half-truth, half-lie. This is the area where Satan lives. He's a liar and the father of lies. We're to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth because Jesus says, I am the truth. The Bible tells us we're to speak the truth in love. What people do with the truth is up to them. But we have a responsibility as Christians to speak the truth. Three questions that are asked of one who has a wasted witness. What did you do to me? Our behavior towards people out there should never lead to that question. Why, why didn't you tell me the truth? That's another question that should never be asked of saints from sinners. And number three, why did you lie to me? How many people have been hurt because of those three questions? As I said, I'm guilty. You probably are too, but 
These things were written for our example. We should learn from this. Learn from our own, own mistakes. Learn from Abram's mistake. And we find ourselves in the midst of worldly people. We need to treat them right. We need to tell them the truth. And we don't need to compromise at all. At all. Let's finish the chapter. He says, he says Why? Saidest thou, she is my sister, I might have taken her to, to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her, go thy way, get out of here, he says. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Get out of here, he says. Go, get. The Bible tells us that we are ambassadors of Christ. Everywhere I go, I'm to represent Him. And if there's one thing you note when you're reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's the way Jesus treated sinners. He tells us that we're to be light in the midst of darkness. We don't need to be dimming the dimmer switch so that we can fit in, lurking in the shadows. We're to stand out a city on a hill. We're to be fishers of men. And Acts 180 says, You'll receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the earth. 1 Peter 3.15, Peter says, We should be ready to give an answer to every man that asks us the hope that we have in Christ. It's okay if we suffer as a Christian, Peter tells us, but we shouldn't be suffering because we're acting like the world. That's what Abraham's doing. He's suffering. He's got a wasted witness because of it. 1 Thessalonians 4.12 says that we are to walk honestly with them that are without. The New Testament talks about them being without. Those who are without, we're to walk honestly before them. Verse Timothy chapter 3 verse 7 tells us that we as leaders should have a good report with them that are without. Abraham was called to be a leader. He was a, to represent the Lord. He should have a good report. To them and what we don't say to them help us lord help us to represent you rightly we ask we pray in jesus name amen